we're here in Granby, Mass, uh, today with Ed Parker. Yep. And Ed, Ed, your specialty is what? Maple syrup. I, uh, I do all my own. I raise everything. I, I rent trees. I collect all the sap myself. I boil it all myself, and I sell it at farmers markets in the summer. And how long have and, you been doing that? Uh, I've been doing the sugar in about 25, 30 years. I've been doing. The, I've only been doing the market since I retired three years ago. Yeah. And why did you get into um, doing maple syrup? What What was the main reason? Something that says, "Gee, the well, light bulb that went off and says that's what I want to do." Well, it's a, I, I always I always wanted to do it. I grew up on a farm where we we had a lot of maple trees. Uh, my family never did it, and I had a, a nephew who came home from college. He was living at the farm, and he says, "Uncle Ed, let's let's tap some trees," and I've been doing it ever since. Uh, I love it. It's all gravity. It's a gravity system. We don't use buckets anymore. It's just too too costly time-wise. Uh, can't get help anymore, you know. So the tubing basically is all pitched. It all comes down to this tank behind us. Uh, we try to keep about a, at least a 2% slope. Uh, this particular little sugar bush area here uh, has just about a 2% slope. Uh, especially on the back line here. And the black lines are what we call uh, main lines. Mm -hmm. And then we have what we call laterals, which are the blue lines going off to the, to the trees. And uh, these are all tree saver taps. We're using very small taps nowadays. Uh, the engineering, the uh, uh, development has come a long way. You know, it used to be we drilled big holes really deep. Now we drill a little 5 16 hole about two inches deep and that's all. So it's kinder so to the trees. It's it's kinder to the trees, and uh, it's kinder to us because it's a much smaller wound, so we can tap more of the tree at different, you know, because you have to stay away from the previous wounds for quite a few years okay. because it, it, it damages a little bit of the tree. Sure. And the sap won't run in that area. So you have to keep moving. So this way we don't have to move as much. Well, that's good. Uh, yeah. It, and speaking uh, of damage, everybody's aware of the really bad storm we had at the end of October. Yeah. How did that affect you with uh, the the it, the syrup there, or, or what do we call the, it there? The uh, maple trees, yeah, and the sugar bush. Yeah. Uh, not as bad as you would think, because most of the damage was oak trees, because oaks still had all their leaves. And the maples had shed their leaves, or were ready to shed, so we didn't have an awful lot of damage. I. Uh, I, I tap about 16, 1,500, 1,600 trees, and I think there's only three that I couldn't tap this year because of damage. Oh, that's excellent. So we did pretty well. A lot of mess in the woods. Sure, you know? sure, yeah. We see a lot <laughs> uh, of as You can, you can that see that here, you know. Uh, it's pretty messy. Of course, this is, uh, I, I basically rent the trees, so uh, the owners are still responsible for the brush, you know. But uh, I end up cleaning a lot of it up just for self-preservation. When do you actually put the taps into the trees? This year I put the taps in on the 19th, uh, 18th and 19th of February. Normally it's about the 1st of March. We're very early this year because of the season. Yeah, we've had a very, yeah. Yeah. We've had a, a, a very mild winter, which too, is, which is nice, yeah. but um, how does that, this mild winter now has an effect on nature? How has that affected the we, trees? Or has it affected the trees? I'm a, I, I'm I'm a, I'm anticipating a very a short season, uh, and most of my colleagues are also. Uh, we had a meeting last night with the uh, Maple Producers Association, okay. and uh, there were there were nine of the nine directors, and uh, we all agreed that we're going to be short. It's going to be a short season. We have no idea of the volume. Of course, that's get with days like this. Now it'll run today. It's as you can see in this tank is about three quarters full and I mm -hmm. emptied it yesterday. But tomorrow there will be almost nothing in it. Because it's gonna be warm again tonight. So and ideally what's the type of temperature you're you're upper, looking for? Upper twenties at night and mid forties during the day is perfect for us. Yeah. If we could get three weeks of that, I'd be happy. <laughs> okay. We'll keep our fingers crossed right. for you. All right, so now the next thing we're going to do is we're going to um, go over to the tank. I'm gonna, and yeah, I'm going to run the hose in, fire up the pump, and we'll uh, suck some sap into the storage, into the tanks on the truck, and go on from there. And what's yeah. the capacity of the, the truck that you get to put the, all the... Each of, these, each of these tanks hold 250 gallons. Yeah. And on average, how much is in... Uh, 
a storage unit like that? Well, that one right now has 40 gallons in it, I believe. Okay, and yeah. if it was full? It was full. I think that's a 65 or, no, that's a 70 gallon drum. Yeah. Okay, yeah. well, I'll let you get on to now. We'll and, do the... And, and that's, the about, that's about average for a, decent, for a decent day's run. I think uh, I have... I believe I have 65 taps in this little area, in this one little area here. So that's a pretty good, pretty good showing for 65 taps. Yeah. Okay, now is it one tap to a tree or uh, can you put multiple taps in a tree? Most of this bush is one tap to a tree. However, the tree up here that has a couple, has two taps in it. Mm -hmm. And then the big trees going up the road have three taps in them. Now how are you able to put the, because of the size S of the size tree? Size of the tree, yeah. If, if the tree's over 16 inches in diameter, you can put two taps in it. If it's over 24 inches, I'll put three taps in it. I won't go more than three taps in a tree. Uh, that's that's my limit. Okay. A lot of people do, and you know, I guess there's nothing wrong with it. What is this? Well, this is a little gas-powered uh, pump, a little uh, th uh, three-quarter horsepower pump, and basically I just take this and suck the tanks out, and it uh, it moves the sap into the trailer, into the truck. Okay, well, let's, yeah. see, let's see this taking place. All right, and it's noisy. There's a little two-cycle engine. Okay, on average, how long does it take to empty out a tank like this? Uh, this? This tank will take about five minutes. That's it? Yeah, yeah, five to six minutes to empty it out. Take yeah. you longer to put the taps into the tree, huh? Oh yeah, <laughs> a lot longer. <laughs> now, speaking of putting taps into the tree, what do you do with it? Do you have to like drill a hole first, or is it something that you use a hammer? Uh, no, we, we drill a hole first. In fact, I have a, I have a gas-powered drill that looks exactly like that with a drill drill bit on instead of a pump and uh, that's what I use a lot of a lot of uh, producers now are using electric uh, you know battery powered drills mm -hmm. but uh, they're expensive and I got this <laughs> and how far into the tree does each drill I mean not each tree but each tap about on a normal tree about I go in about two inches uh, bigger older trees you have to go in a little further because the bark is thicker but uh, not more. I won't go in more than two and a half inches. That's. In fact, we use a bit that has a that only has a two and a half inch exposure on it from the chuck. Okay. Now I know you said that after the, you have the tap in there, that maybe with a few years down the road, you would possibly, you know, be able to go back. And, now, can you use that same section that you had used, or would you use another section with it? Oh, oh no, you you use another section, another hole. Yeah. These these holes will close right up. Okay. Uh, in fact, uh, well, he's way over there, but right on this tree here. Yeah, he has a zoom lens, so we're okay. okay. See, th this is an old tap hole right here. Oh, okay. And uh, this is probably last year's. So, you know, they, they, it, they close in pretty fast. Actually, it looks like a hole that we had had some bees that they called them boring bees. It right. looked like the side of what they were doing to, to yeah. the soffits at our house. Yeah, yeah. Now these also were old. These were older taps. These are old seven sixteenths taps. Now the holes are uh, you can almost not. It's it's hard to even see the hole now yeah, so after two all, years. So they seal up at that point. Yeah, then you use yeah. you use new sites on the tree. For right. See, we can go. Now this was really probably too close, but we could go probably five six inches away and be all right. Yeah. And of course the we don't do anything when when we pull the tap out. We leave it because the, the tree will heal itself. Uh, it's better if we don't plug it or anything because that way Mother Nature does it and it, does it, heals, it, best. it heals from the inside out. So if there's any any foreign matter, it'll push it out. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Down to 20 gallons now. You see, there's a mark. It's written. It's a oh, che yeah. cheater marks on the tank. Keep track of these. When I get back in the truck, I'll mark it down. I'll mark the gallons I have. That way, uh, I check all. Of, I I have 18, 18 or 20 of these locations, and then next year, I can go through my records, and I can see the 
the, the uh, areas that were slowing down early, and I may I may need to redo those areas. Maybe need, me put new uh, new taps and drop lines on, because they will. The bacteria will back up, mm -hmm. and no matter what you do, you you know unless you take everything apart and sterilize it, you can't really get all the bacteria out of the lines. So what we do probably every I try it every five or six years to change the tap, which is the black thing, right. and the drop line, which goes down to the lateral. Uh, I'll change those every five or six years. Now, now, is that expensive using the tubing overall? Uh, no, because the, the rest of the tubing lasts for years. Uh, it costs about two dollars and a half to change a drop line mm -hmm. and tap. Uh, and it doesn't take, it just takes a couple of minutes. I, I'm not, now, this particular area, I completely redid this, this this year. This is all brand new tubing, everything. Uh, it it had old an old setup on it that I didn't really like. Yeah. And I didn't know that much about it when I set it up. It was one of my early tubing jobs. And, uh, oh, the line kept coming apart and, you know, just... It was a mess. Half the time I wouldn't have anything in the drum that would all be on the ground somewhere. So so last summer I just pulled everything apart, pulled everything down and started all over. We try not to put more than five or six taps on each on each of the laterals. Because uh, that's only a little, that's less than a 5 16 inch tubing. And uh, so it works better to keep it down, especially on vacuum, to have, have you know, not to have too many, I mean, on, on gravity, not to have too many taps on the line. And on average, uh, how long would it take to fill one of these tanks um, to, to the area that you're this, satisfied with? This, oh, this one was, this one was I, I emptied this yesterday morning about this time. So it, it, it was very good today. Now, this is the first time um, I've seen uh, a setup this way. When we had been in Canada, we, they were doing it um, with just a tap and then a bucket. And I'm saying, I think this is a better way because it's, it's more protected. That was a while ago. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we're talking o over 12 years ago. <laughs> yeah, because yeah, this, of course, yeah, this is all sealed. There's no bugs or no problem with bugs getting in it. And, you know, the, uh, the uh, bugs sure did like, especially moths love maple syrup. And they'd get in the buckets and they'd fill the tops, you know. Sure, free food. They don't even have to work for it. Yeah, yeah. All right, we're ready to move on. To okay, we're now uh, we're at our second uh, second pickup location. Okay. And this one's a little different. We're down in the woods, and uh, we have to run out about uh, well, I guess about 70 feet of hose here. We got 100 uh, 150 feet on this reel, and it's all food grade hose. Everything everything here is food grade. Most of the stuff is readily available through our suppliers and so forth, so we don't have much trouble uh, getting it food grade. Okay. So, so we'll head down. I'll make sure it unwinds it'll, for you, Ed. How's it'll, that? It'll, un, it'll unwind itself. This is an area that's never been tapped before. Uh, when I was a kid, this was a pasture. Okay. So uh, you can see from the age of some of these trees, I'm getting old. Well, <laughs> if you don't get Cause, old, what's the alternative? Because the trees have to be about 40 to 45 years old before they're big enough to be tapped. Oh, okay. So uh, I just started this this year. It's a friend of mine that lives up on the hill up here. And uh, there's a lot more to do. Uh, Another year, I'll have another whole section out in the back here. It'll be, it'll, it'll make a nice little, little sugar bush. Yeah, that's good because this way here, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. You already have the road coming in, into the section of yeah, the woods, right. and, and yeah. uh, then you just go and just move it on a little bit. Yeah, yeah, I can work. In fact, uh, I can work from where the truck is now, uh, over the other side of the hill here, and mm -hmm. set up another tank over on the other side. So it'll work out very nicely. So, shall we pump some sap? There we go, let's go. That's, a, that's what we like about the pump. Absolutely. Once it's fired up, one pull and it runs. See, it's, 
Flowing pretty good this morning. Okay, now how many gallons would you think on average is in this container? I, I think there's about 20 gallons, 25 gallons in this container. It's a 50 gallon tank cut in half, so there's probably about 18, 20 gallons in there now. Now and, how do you know, uh, obviously from experience, as to, you know, how often you have to come and uh, be able to empty out your tank so that you don't lose well, the sap. Well, this this bush I'm just learning now. I got I, I need a larger tank. Uh, yesterday I came and it was running over, uh, and I hadn't. I it had been two days. So uh, normally I pick up uh, every other day all the tanks, but this one and one other that we're going to pick up in a few minutes I have to pick up because I I underestimated the tank size. Well, that's a good thing now that you know that it's producing so well. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and uh, you know, you just don't know. A lot of young trees here, and, which, and uh, not a lot of not not a lot of cover of uh, of canopy on some of these trees. And usually, the more the larger the canopy, the better the yield. Okay, now when you're referring to canopy, what we're, are you referring to? We're referring to the branches at the top of the tree. Okay. And and you know, they uh, these big old shade trees along the road. I mean. They produce a lot of sap because they've got all that canopy, all that branches to work with. Uh, whereas these, of course, they grew up in the woods. They're, they don't have quite as much, but they still do very well. This would be a great area, and uh, I may be able to thin it. I'm gonna, I'm gonna check with the owner because uh, this, this could be a super area, but it does need to be thinned and cleaned up. <coughs> Some, some of these trees are a little bit closer than they should be. You know, you don't, uh, they'll, they'll do better if it's spread out a little bit. You know, it's uh, right on the end here. So I've got, right here, I've got three trees right tight together. Yeah. <coughs> that should just be one tree. But here, one of the, this one should be, of course, this is an oak tree anyway. It should be cut out. Give the other tree room for nour more nourishment and so forth. It, uh, Makes for a, a nicer setup. It's a beautiful day today, too. A lot better than what they were predicting. I know it. It's almost too nice. <laughs> I know, I know. That's why Al kept on checking the temperature to see how it would work out. I also need to do something about this line. This line needs to be needs to be stiffer and I can't seem to get, get it to stay tight. I'm going to try it one more time here. Well, it's definitely an art trying to find out the, uh, the magic for the, for the setting for each <laughs> one of your particular uh, harvesting uh, sections. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, we're about done here. So this location then you said was how many feet? It was 75 feet of hose. Yeah. Well that's what experience. You're able to pick it out exactly what it was gonna be. I have one spot which 
we aren't going to do today, but that I use all but three wraps. Okay, we're at our third okay. stop now. Okay, yeah, this is our third stop. This is this is at Bachelor Brook. This is another. This is an old farm. He's, uh, I think, about the third or fourth generation, and uh, they got a sawmill across the street, and he let me tap his trees. And uh, of course, you know, in exchange for a little maple syrup, you know. Sure, that's a fair uh, trade. So, uh, <laughs> and uh, you do the work, he uh, gets to use that and gets the benefits. Yeah, yeah, it works. It works both ways, and I can leave everything up here except well, I take the lines down that are up by the house here, but that's all. And uh, so we'll head down. <clears throat> this brook runs so slow, it's almost flat down here. I had to, I had to actually use. Uh, Use some engineering equipment to decide how uh, how much pitch I needed on my line. Okay, we're gonna go down now, Al. So I'll wait at this stage so that you can I don't hold up the the line coming down there. Did you say the name of this area? This is Bachelor Brook. It is Bachelor Brook. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Starts. Starts in Belchtown and goes to Connecticut River. Looks like it's a haven for the ducks too and the other wildlife. Oh, they love it. Yeah. They're serenading us. Okay. There. Now we're back in business. Now this is this is a site that I could not do last winter. You couldn't find any of my lines. They were all buried in snow. Oh. We had you know there was so much snow, and uh, by the time the snow got down enough so we could see the lines, it was pretty near the end of the season anyway. So. Now the lines that you're referring to too, because I know we've got the the yeah. black ones. Basically, yeah, mostly the main line, but some, even a lot of these, a lot of these laterals were were uh, under snow also. But they can stay up all year round. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. I just when I get all done, I start pulling the taps out, and I I fill my tanks with water, and I reverse everything. Everything runs just the opposite. I plug my I plug my holes into the end of the main line and I just flush everything out with water. And how long is that process on average? I know depending uh, on the site, but say, you know, an average site of yours. Well, it would take me a couple hours to flush this line out. There's uh, 90, 90 taps on this particular line. It would take me an hour and a half to two hours. It's kind of steep and I'm getting old, you know. <laughs> Well, that's, that's why I got my, my working shoes on, so I figured I'd be out sitting no matter where we go. Yeah, yeah. Sure is handy doing it this way, though. Oh, yeah. Oh, can you imagine trying to, buckets, trying to carry them up the hill? No, you just, the top trees were tapped years ago. The fellow, fellow over on, the, on Aldrich Lake tapped them. But he never tapped any of the lower stuff here. Didn't want to go through the effort, huh? Hard. Yeah, it was hard, you know. Sure. Now, we were talking on, on the right over to here about up in the Berkshires, as far as oh. them, you know, weather-wise and stuff, what it would take for them to be able to run it versus running it over here. Yeah, no, normally in the Berkshires, they'll run about two weeks behind me. Uh, the guys on vacuum will be a little bit, they'll come out closer to me because they can suck it out of the trees, but most of them, They'll, they'll run behind later. Uh, this year, however, I think everybody is running about the same. Uh, everybody I talked to in my meeting last night, the, uh, the directors of the Mass Maple there, they were all, they've all almost, if they haven't boiled, they're all ready to boil. So, and, and these are guys from all over the, guys and gals from all over the state. So, uh, it's all, first year in a long time that everybody's done, started about the same time. It's coming in just as fast as it's going out, just about. Yeah, I will definitely get out here early tomorrow morning to get this, to suck this tank out and change the tanks. Well, we appreciate you waiting for us to come on board here <laughs> so that we get to record this. 
Yeah. Well, you know, the way the weather was, uh, I thought, gosh, if you could work it today, it was going to be perfect. And uh, Well, that's why I, I took time off from work there, so we could uh, <laughs> yeah. come and get this one. Because we said, yeah. we know you have to work around Mother Nature. When she, when she decides she wants to start producing, oh, yeah. that's when we yeah. got to go with yeah. her. She yeah. sets the schedule. Now, my guess is tomorrow morning there won't be much. Because it won't be cold enough tonight. It'll, they'll run today pretty well. Mm -hmm. But then tomorrow it'll shut right down. Unless it gets, until it gets cold. Never realized yeah. that was so in tune towards uh, the temperature in order to get yeah. the sap. I just oh, yeah. figured once it's in there, the trees do their things, and that's yeah. it. I, oh, didn't, no. I didn't realize all the other science behind it. Yeah, no, the sap will stay suspended in the tree unless it gets cold enough at night. And uh, then it drops back down. Okay, okay. so now, now right. we're back at the sugar house? Now we're back at the sugar house. We're going to unload the tank and uh, going to uh, put the sap into a storage tank here. Uh, just Can you to, tell me a little something it. about the storage tanks itself? These these are old these are actually old milk tanks. Okay. And uh, of course, as all the dairy farms have gone out, the milk tanks have come to sugar houses. <laughs> yeah, because it looks like it's they stainless were, steel. They are they are stainless steel. They make they make great tanks for us. Uh, the side walls are all insulated. Mm -hmm. The tops are not. And the one thing I need to do is put a roof over these, keep the sun off them. But. Uh, you know, we don't hold the sap an awful long time. I did, that that tank was full last night. This tank had, was partly full. Uh, and I, I held it because of today, uh, because doing this. Right, uh, well, we appreciate no, it. Normally I would have brought it in and I would have boiled it right down last night. Mm -hmm. But, uh, and I was also tired last night. Cause we'd had a couple long, long days here. So, uh, but now we'll, we'll hook it up. This of course is all gravity. Gravity system. Again, it's all food grade hose. Down a, down a Flynn bar, I had to pay a fortune for it. And what's the capacity of these tanks uh, on average? This one holds about 300 gallons, that one holds 350, and the flat one over there holds 375. Oh, I see. So you have one big uh, suction here to be able to drain it all off. Yeah. Yeah, this is a two-inch hole, so it drains it off fairly fast. Sure beats taking a bucket, emptying it in, taking a bucket, emptying it in, huh? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and see from here, well, you see after I move my truck, from here we, we pump it up into this little feed tank up here, which filters, filters out all the uh, bugs and, and debris. And, so forth and uh, that tank is full right now I made room made room for this good good we appreciate yeah. that as we're here <laughs> we can get our, our viewing audience to be able to see something right. that they wouldn't yeah. normally have that opportunity so we thank you for delaying it for this uh, well, filming yeah I was glad to do it it's, it's kind of a neat hobby uh, and you know we, we do have a lot of hobbyist sugars sugar makers and it's fun, and uh, I like to encourage it. You know, young fellows like to, like my my tenant's grandson here. You know, he might grow up to be a sugar maker. You never can tell. Right now, you were talking about your organization on average, okay? And I didn't catch the the full name of it, the one that you were uh, oh, in the meeting last night. Massachusetts Maple Producers Association. On yeah. average, how many um, members are there? Uh, approximately 200, 200 to 225. Uh, it, it, it varies. It varies, sure, yeah. it varies year to year. You know, uh, some people forget to renew. Some people come on aboard. Uh, yeah, and the funny, the 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 thing that's that I found remarkable when I first joined, uh, I was really a backyard sugar at the time, mm -hmm. and uh, I found that so are most of the other members. Uh, there are some big producers. There are some producers that that have uh, seven, eight thousand taps. But the big majority have, well, I'm, they, they call me a medium producer. I've got about 1,600 taps. There are um, probably 60% of the membership has less than 50 taps. Wow. Uh, one of the big pluses of being a member, of course, is you can buy containers at a discount because we, the association buys the containers and sells sure. them. Uh, and we do, we do a couple seminars a year. Uh, we have an annual meeting, which we have a trade show and 
so people can see what's new and what they want to buy and so forth. And uh, uh, it's it's a good organization. And just just meeting with the other sugar makers and hearing everybody else's problems, you know, sure. makes you makes you feel better, you know. <laughs> and how they resolve some of them. Yeah, right. That that's the big thing, you know. Uh, but uh, it's it's a good good group, and uh, we enjoy it. I've been I've been a member for. I'm 25 years. I'm president right now. Oh, congratulations! And, uh, thank you. Yeah. So, uh, and we have a good board of directors. We meet, uh, we meet once a month, mm -hmm. and uh, we also have a booth and in the mass building at the Big E. And that is our Big E. That's the big thing that we do uh, oh. once a year. And uh, you know, it's a, we make candy there. We make maple cream there. It's it's, we sell a lot of product there, but it's our main goal is education. Sure, we've bought you know. from there because we, you know, we sure. hit the big yeah. E all the time. So now yeah. we can say, you know, <laughs> we know you're president. <laughs> well, this year you might see me there a lot because I'm going to be there an awful lot. I was last year too, but uh, all right. So we're the tank's empty, and we can uh, move on to, to the next phase. I'll move on to the next phase. I'll move the truck, and we can uh, clean up the sugar house. I've got another question, maybe a little bit odd or anything else like that, but with the um. With the sugar and uh, sugar house and stuff, do you ever get bothered by bears? Because we are out in the woods and everything. <laughs> and I know in certain areas there's bears, so do you ever get you, any visitors? You will notice the doors are closed yep. when I'm not in it. Because I never want to be outside with a bear inside. I've had bears come up as far as where the tractor is to visit. Mm -hmm. yeah. Usually in the summer when I'm making candy. That's when they'll come? The bear, there's a, a bear. Mm -hmm. And I have no idea if it's the same bear each time, but, but yeah, they'll, I can, they'll come over the wall and they'll come sniffing up along. And uh, usually, I, you know, you feel, you sense somebody's there. Sure, sure. So I'll look out the door and sure enough. And Not we'll, a paying customer. <laughs> no, we'll talk to each other for a minute or two and then she'll just saunter away and off she goes. Wow. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of neat. This is what we call a filter tank. Uh, it's also, it supplies the evaporator. So we do, we pump from the storage tanks into this. And once we're in here, then it gravity's into the evaporator. And everything from here on until we filter it again is gravity. And, okay, uh, now we're saying we're filtering it. What type of material are you using to a, be the filter? A, this is a paper filter. And uh, it'll last for probably seven, eight hundred gallons at this time of year. Later in the season it gets less and less. <laughs> uh, you have to use more of them. But uh, uh, this tank, as I say, I filled it. I filled it this morning. So we're all set, all set to go. There's also a, a bobber in here. So I'll show you inside. I can tell. I don't have to come out here to check the tank to see if it's low. I, I can check it inside. Okay, that's clever. Uh, Saves you a lot of steps that way. Okay, I happen to see one of those old uh, maple syrup buckets I was talking about tapped into the tree. It's yeah. tapped into a pine building. How does that work? Well, it doesn't produce much sap, but it does create a lot of curiosity. And it did so today, and, too. Uh, you know, people are always interested in how it used to be, you know, so that's, that's why the bucket's there. Okay, we're at the Parker Sugar House, and as we're getting ready to go in to see the filtering process take place, uh, Ed, I happen to see you've got this sign here saying maple grading regulations. Maybe you can right. uh, give this, us a little uh, clue as to what this is all about. Our Mass Maple Producers Association has developed this along with, us, with the state, with the Department of Agriculture. And uh, basically it's, it's how we grade our syrup. Uh, you know, we've got three different grades of grade, grade, three different levels of grade A. We've got light, medium, and dark, and it gives a little description about them. And then our commercial syrup or our cooking syrup, which is considered B or C, which we don't even put C on here because that's strictly commercial. Mm -hmm. uh, that's really dark, heavier syrup, stronger, stronger flavor. Uh, it's kind of a kind of nice. People can look at it and give an idea, you know, uh, what's going on. Would that be the last the last one when you were saying the the B classification? Is that what they were making the candy or something out of that one? Or? No, no candy we make out of the out of the very light the lightest syrup we can. Uh, 
the the B grade syrup you would use in granola. Okay. Uh, cooking things, you mm -hmm. know, because you want the flavor. Uh, you know, uh, squash. Mm -hmm. Mixing it with squash or anything. Uh, but yeah. Al even puts it into grits. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he yeah. found out you oh, put yeah. a little butter, a little bit of the maple <laughs> syrup, and Al's, it doesn't and, hurt. and Al's in heaven. Yeah, I do it with my coffee <laughs> every day. Yeah, yeah. So oh, really? You put maple syrup into coffee? Instead, yeah, instead of sugar. Yeah. Ah. Yeah, don't use sugar at all. Just, and, you know, if you use a light syrup, yeah. you know, it sweetens the coffee and you don't taste the syrup. If you, if you use the grade B, you can taste the syrup. Yeah, so. That'll be go go into a restaurant. And we'll bring our own little supply of maple syrup and we'll put them in there and we'll see what they ask us about. That's right. There are there are a couple of restaurants where you can actually buy my maple syrup. Oh yeah, we're in this local well, area one, here. One, one in town and one in Connecticut. Uh, one in uh, Hazardville. Was it Country Diner, Hazardville, Connecticut? Okay, yeah, we've yeah, eaten there. Yeah, yeah. yeah very supply, good. I, I supply him with maple syrup. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. So we're gonna go inside. We're now. all set to fire up the evaporator. I lay the fire at night because uh, what I do after I cover the evaporator. I sweep the floor and get all this stuff, it goes in the fire. So, you know, because it costs us money to go to the landfill nowadays. Absolutely, so, that's for uh, sure. So the fire is all laid at, the night before. So we're going to get it fired up. My knees don't Not as in dark and dark. Horses are pretty cool, huh? Yeah. That's much better. Much faster than a match. Way better. And it doesn't burn my fingers. <laughs> And it's yeah. a, this is in a cast iron. It's a cast iron. Uh, the the ends are cast thing. iron. The sides are uh, are tin. It's all lined with fire brick. Uh, this this style evaporator has been made or style arch. The bottom bottom part is called an arch. Okay. And that's been made for years and years and years by this Grimm company up in Rutland, Vermont. Which now they've merged with another company and moved out of Rutland. But uh, they were in an old wooden building. The uh, this particular setup I bought six years ago when I built the sugar house and uh, bought it from a fellow up, in, up above Rutland, Vermont, in fact, and uh, moved it down here. It's a three and a half by ten foot evaporator. Uh, the front pan, the flue pan, is what, what is covered. And that's got, uh, that has a steam, steam hood, has a preheater in it, which preheats the sap before it gets into the uh, evaporator. And then this is this is what we call a finish pan. Uh, I'm running electronic thermometer on it and electronic uh, what we call a drop, so that I actually, by the time we get through, mm -hmm. you'll see me checking with a, with the hydrometer. We can actually run completely finished syrup right off the evaporator. And what's the temperature that you would um, ideally like to be able to be at? 219 .5. plus well yesterday we were 6, I mean. yesterday we were running 219.6 and it was coming out absolutely perfect right on right on uh, yeah it's the day before yesterday I'm sorry uh, today it might run a little bit lower we may run about 219.4 but we'll find out you'll you'll see me checking when we get it going and it, what are you looking for when you're checking it what you know what qualities are you looking for this to be at right now I'm looking for viscosity period. The, the density is the final, that's the final number. Uh, the temperature gives us a good idea, but we have to adjust that by the, by the uh, atmosphere. So, uh, and, uh, and you know, we adjust there, actually, you know, by tenths of a degree. It, it makes that much difference. And uh, then after we, after we do that, and uh, when we get ready to bottle, of course, then we look at the color. Mm -hmm. And uh, the color and taste, and that's what determines what we put on the label, whether it's light or we very well could make medium today because this has been sitting in the evaporator for two days. Uh, so uh, it may be medium syrup. Uh, by afternoon, we'll be making light again because what's in those storage tanks will come back light, I'm sure. I hope because <laughs> I need I need a lot of light light syrup for candy. Okay. Because I yeah. sell I sell a lot of candy at the farmers markets. And yeah. you said at the Big E as well, so we want to make certain that you well, do get that. Yeah, the Big E we sell, the members actually all sell syrup to the association. And the association has the, has the syrup bottled, mm -hmm. and we make the candy right there. Oh, right on the spot. Right, right on the spot, right at the Big E, yeah. Oh, okay. So, you know, it could be my syrup, or it could be any one of 
20 guys, you know. Uh, whoever has the syrup to sell, the, uh, will, you know, the shelf station will buy it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, I gotta check the stove, get my gloves on here. Getting some nice warm heat out of this too. It will in a minute, yeah. It'll get warm enough before we get through. We'll, all, oh, we'll probably have the doors open. Yeah. Now, is there a certain time period uh, normally that this will take on average? Well, it's hard to say because we, we have an automatic feed. And the best I can... The best way to describe it is I can make about a gallon and a half of syrup an hour, mm -hmm. which means I'm using about 75 gallons of sap, uh, evaporating about 75 gallons of sap to do it. Yes. <laughs> and we also use a timer. We fire the stove every seven minutes. And, and that's to keep that's to keep a consistent keep, heat. Keep the keep the fire consistent. Yes, yes, yeah. Now I see you have what was that like four baffles in between separating yeah, it? Yeah. What what happens? Yeah, I never did explain the evaporator, did we? Uh, today, the way I'm operating today, the raw syrup, the raw sap is coming through the through the preheater up here, which is actually homemade. A fellow, uh, fell up in Vermont that I bought the system from. His dad. Uh, the sheet metal worker, he made this, he made all this top part. The raw sap actually comes in on this tube and then it has to travel up these, through these tubes, and then it drops down on the other side into a, uh, uh, into a float chamber. This also, the, the reason these pipes are so crooked, this is where the steam goes up and I want condensation because I want hot water. Oh, okay. So the, it, the condensation comes back down into this pan underneath here, and out the other side is a. I fill the bucket with hot water, and that way I have water to clean clean up with and so forth at the end of the day, or Ross wash things with whatever I need. And then this part of the evaporator, the way I'm operating today, we we swap sides actually every day. Okay. And why is that? The sugar so the. the it, prevents the sugar sand from building up in the finish pan. We sugar get sand. Sugar sand and, and, and nitre, which is uh, basically it's calcium uh, and uh, some foreign matter that, that you know doesn't that sinks in the bottom of it as, as the syrup is separating. And uh, if that builds up of course it'll plug up everything. And rather than try to filter it all out through the filter press, if we swap the evaporator, if we swap sides of the evaporator for some reason, it kind of helps to push it out. It works it where it works. That's where experience yeah. comes into play. Yeah, yeah. Hey, you know, and, and the day you get real busy and don't swap the evaporator over from one side to the other is the day you wish you had, you know, because the next day is terrible. But uh, the pan is, this is what we call a raised flue. Inside, there are uh, lines of, that the sap runs down actually right to the bottom. And then the lines, the, 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 the grooves are about eight inches deep, so it runs about up to here. And there's six of them on each side. So the fire is actually going between all those, all those grooves. Okay. And of course, the whole idea of this is a, as, as much heat surface as we can make. And in the bottom here is all, as, as I said before, it's all uh, done in, uh, and fire brick, and I have two two chambers in here actually, which is kind of this fellow up in, in Vermont was kind of kind of neat. He also did a lot of masonry work, and we have two what we call dams built up in here. There's two areas across where the fire is actually forced up into those in, into those uh, raised flues, mm -hmm. and then back here it drops. There's an opening about two inches, and when it really gets cranking, you'll hear it. It sounds just like a locomotive. And what it is, it's the reburning in the back. And uh, so we're getting a lot more heat out of our, out of our wood.
which is a more far, efficient way to do which, things. Which is far from efficient. I mean, we burn a lot of wood. The, this old evaporator is really kind of passe now. It's, uh, I love it, and I like the taste of the syrup. But new, new, new arches now will produce the same amount of syrup with half the wood. I mean, they're just so much more efficient. And, and how much more do they cost? If, if somebody was to set up, I'm sure if you took that cost factor there, into there, play. There is grant money available. Uh, oh. There, there are grants through the USDA and through several organizations. Uh, you know, basically because you use so much less wood, you're saving a lot more trees. Mm -hmm. So, uh, uh, of course, on the other hand, I use slab wood. Or anything. Yes, <laughs> you know? So uh, and stuff. yeah. So you know, just how much they're saving, it's kind of hard to say. But uh, but it, and of course, it's a lot of labor saving. It's very. That's the biggest thing. Yeah. And uh, man, it does. You still can make good syrup. But yeah, there's a lot of a lot of new technology that they keep coming up with. You know. There always is, no but, matter what in what field but, you are in. But, but of course, in our business, it's all food grade. Nothing is inexpensive. It's all expensive, and uh, you know, a, a bucket, a new, a new 16, 16 quart bucket, it's eighty five dollars. Just, just you know, stainless steel. You, you saw the the filter tank outside. Right. Well, this is this is the other end of it. Uh, the sap comes into the evaporator up here. We had talked about the uh, uh, preheater, which is up in the top. Goes in this line. It comes back out of the preheater, comes down into a float chamber. And this controls the level in the in the slew pan. We only run about an inch of sap over the top of those slews, so it's very critical that it stays the same because this gets very hot in a few minutes. Mm -hmm. And so this float chamber will do that. It'll it'll control the level. And it'll let more sap in as, as we evaporate more water off of it. We can check the level. Uh, right over here on this tube, you see this little black line here? Yes. That's, that's the level I want inside. And that, uh, that keeps that, that uh, visual for me to see if, if I look at that and I see that's down a little bit too much, or oh, something's wrong. And, you know, during the cold weather, you have to worry about the lines freezing up coming in and so forth. But, uh, and we're getting a nice uh, aroma right yeah, now coming yeah, in. Right, yeah, yeah. Too and bad then, we can't share that with the audience as yeah, well. <laughs> yeah, this plumb bob over here, there's a full mark down here. That's when the tank is right up. This uh, little supply tank is chuck full, the filter tank. As the plumb bob rises, of course, the volume in this tank goes down. I've got a, I've got a, uh, a weight, uh, wood weight in the tank. It uh, floats with the, with the sap. So it saves you a lot of running around from inside going Sa outside back and forth. Saves a lot of running around and a lot of, a lot of uh, heartache when you, when you run out of sap. Don't know it. Uh, and uh, it also tells me when I'm, when I'm at the end of the day, mm -hmm. uh, I've got marks up there to tell me when to shut down. So I can see where I need to stop firing, stop firing the evaporator and uh, letting it close because it takes a long time. It'll take... It takes as long to cool down as it does to heat up uh, now. And uh, of course, you can't leave it because you know you gotta keep make sure the sap in there to yep. keep it going. I'm opening the steam doors so we can get rid of some of the steam. This this is my son's well the steam doors, everybody has them, but but the method was my son's idea. <laughs> he, he rigged up the cables and stuff. So he says about maple sugaring? This, this, is, this is a friend, a friend of mine did this many years ago. Uh, in fact, I, I bought all of her equipment about 15, 20, well, at least 15 years ago, I guess. And she gave me this. I think she had made this. And this basically is a description from way back when the Indians started boiling and how they did it and so forth. And the, the tools they used and whatnot, and a little, little thing about the, you know, one tap in a 12 inch tree, two taps in an 18, three taps in a 22 inch tree, and then it uh, talks about the different style spiles they used to use. They didn't, they didn't call them taps, they called them spiles. And they were sumac. And sumac, of course, has a hollow center. Right. And, and they would push out the, the, they would clean out the sumac, 
and they would drive that into the tree. And uh, <clears throat> that, was, that, was, that was their version of a tap. And then, of course, they have the buckets on the ground. But to heat it, to, to boil it down, of course, they boiled it right down to solid because they wanted the sugar, the mm -hmm. preservative. And they, they had these big wooden vessels, and they actually heated rocks and threw the hot rocks into the sap. And they just kept doing that. I mean, they must have done it for days to boil it down, but that's how they, that's how they made their uh, sugar. We're in my candy room now, which is kind of the sweetest part of the whole operation. And uh, uh, what you see over on this side, the, these, are, these trays are what we put the uh, molds in. Uh, we use rubber, rubber molds. We have all, all sorts of different molds. We, these are, happen to be bunnies. And we've got fish and we've got, we've got Santa Clauses, uh, plus the traditional maple leaves and so forth. And we set these in the trays. And uh, we, we fill them, which we'll show you in a, in a minute. And then they go back in the tray, back in the in drying rack for two or three hours until they cool down. And then after they cool down, we, we pop them out of the molds, right into the, into the pans. And then we have another drying rack over on the other side, which we let, I like to let them dry overnight. Uh, because we eventually put them into, uh, into these little plastic bags and uh, these plastic bags are sealed. So we like to get most of the moisture out before we bag them so that we don't end up with water drops and so forth. It just, it looks nicer and, and it preserves the candy much longer. Now of course, the first thing we do when we take the, the finished the maple syrup, uh, we heat it on the stove, which is over the other side of the sugar house and we heat it up, instead of 219 degrees, we heat it up to about 238 to 239 degrees. And we take more liquid out of the sugar, out of the, out of the uh, syrup. And then when we get through, we bring it into the, uh, uh, into the evaporator. This is what affectionately the sugar makers call a pig. And you can see it, it has a snout and it has a tail. Yeah tail is the, this auger and what we do we, we pour the we pour the hot syrup into the into, into the pig we cool it down a little bit uh, I like to cool it down to around 200 degrees 195 and then we run it in the auger and it actually aerates it it brings air into it and with this control here that's how we we fill these molds and uh, so we, We'll make up probably two or three quarts of syrup at a time, which, which will fill about 14 racks, uh, 14 uh, uh, of these pans. And then they go into the drying rack. Over, we, they end up in this drying rack over here. And from there, we, we package them. Now, we, we, as I showed you a lot of it, we do the, we do the bags. We also do some, bo some boxes. And we do some larger boxes. Uh, we have three or four sizes, depending upon the type of year, the time of year, and so forth. Christmas time, we'll do more boxes for gifts. Summer farmers markets, we do little packages for for kids, because they all want a package for for a buck or a buck and a half. And <clears throat> then the the only other thing we do in the sugar house, uh, I also make maple cream, and. Maple cream is made again on the stove. It's not, you don't heat the syrup quite as hot as you do for syrup for candy. Uh, and that is strictly a labor job. You get it up to, you get it up to temperature and then you cool it very, very quickly down to about 80, 85 to 100 degrees. And then you stir it and you just stir it until it turns almost white. And uh, it creates a nice texture. It's, it's uh, it's almost, uh, we, we call it maple cream, but it's actually, it's almost a buttery texture uh, or, uh, or peanut butter texture. And it goes great on, on muffins and so forth and uh, bagels and, and donuts. <laughs> That's what we're going to do next week at, the, at our, grand, uh, our grand tapping up in Williamsburg. We, we fill these little half pound and pound containers. Uh, again, Masters of Maple Producers furnishes them or sells them to us at a discount. And uh, 
they're very good. They sell very, very well at the farmer's markets. I, I'm amazed at the number of people who know about maple cream. And I also, also carry a sample jar. So that if they don't know about it when they come to the market, they know about it when they leave. And they'll buy it next time they come. We've run sa syrup off, according to my electronic thermometer here, at approximately 219.5 today because of, the, because of the atmosphere is fairly high pressure. And now we're going to check the finished syrup to check the viscosity to see, to make sure it is thick enough so we can filter it and bottle it. So I have a, we'll fill this up. And this, this tube has a, has a thermometer built right into it. Of course, we have to adjust for temperature when we're checking viscosity on, on syrup. Can we hold that for you? Sure. And okay. where are we going next? And, uh, well, I forgot to bring my, my uh, thing over here. So. And officially, what's the technical name for the thing? This is the hydrometer. Okay. Yeah. I usually use the technical names like the thing. Yeah. So that, that's why I wanted to find yeah. out what this was called. This is the hydrometer and the, and, the, and the hydrometer cup. And we check the temperature over here. The temperature is 183 degrees. The, right now, the bricks is 60 point, wow, it's high. Looks like it's 60.4. Which means what? Which means it's very thick. 60.4. I have a chart over here. Okay. 182 degrees. Can we take that oh, chart down it? over here? Yeah. Okay, we are running very thick. So constantly, before the next batch runs, we're going to want to drop our temperature considerable. We were running at 19.5. I'm going to run it down to 219 even. Now I'm going to run it down to 218.8 to see if I can compensate. So I'll run thinner sap into there, and hopefully by the time we fill that, it'll be about right. I dropped it four tenths of a degree because we were so thick. And uh, so now instead of instead of the thermometer going to 219.4, it went to 218.8. At that, it opens a magnet which actually draws the shutoff valve open and lets the sap run, as you, you saw the sap running earlier. So we're going to check the viscosity again to see if we are anywhere near correct. Hopefully, we're going to be ready to uh, put this through the filter press and bottle it. Now, about how many gallons of sap did it take to get to this point right here? About, about 100. 100, 100 gallons of sap. At least, oh, more than that. Because there's probably four gallons in there, so probably uh, 200 gallons of sap. 200 gallons of sap. That's yeah. a lot yeah. of sap. So now we check the hydrometer here. Okay. How we're are we still looking? Still high. Well, uh, we're 170.7 degrees on the thermometer, and we are 60.123. Woo. 60.4, but 170 degrees, so a little bit cooler. So that will be a difference. So we take our little chart here, and we look for the closest temperature. It should be 170 is right between these two readings, right between right. 176. So it should be about 60.4, uh, and 60.8, and we're 64. Uh, we're 60. Now wait a minute. Where are we? We're 60.9. Not bad. 60.5. We're a little bit strong, but nowhere near as strong as we were earlier. So. Uh, my overcorrection worked. Worked pretty well. Well, that's where experience will, uh, comes in and you know what to do to make that so yeah. you can get the right balance that you need to do. So now, since we're, gonna, we're going to run that through the filter press, we're going to start again. So now I'm going to go back up. Whoop, back up. 
I'm going to reset at 219.1. That's an educated guess that it's going to be right. Okay, now what's <laughs> this going to do for us? This, this now is going to go through, is going to be mixed with diatinaceous earth and it's going to go through the filter press. Okay. It's, uh, it's pretty close and we want to be accurate. So, you know, we, we, uh, we rinse everything between times so that we don't have any residue from this batch of syrup into the next batch. Because it can really affect it quite a bit. It's, it's amazing what a little sap, what a little syrup will do to another batch. Hmm. We'll get this all rinsed out. At the end of the day when I wash this stuff, we do it with vinegar, I mean with uh, uh, with bleach and water. Bleach and water? We use no soap at all in the sugar house. The last thing we want is soap residue in the syrup. Right, right. And uh, if we keep things clean and we use we use maple syrup product or maple syrup tools and equipment for only maple syrup. Year round. We don't do anything else with the stuff at all. So we don't have we shouldn't have any problem with cross contamination. Okay, now, the next process. This is the secret ingredient. Aha! Uh -huh. <laughs> Do I have to block it so nobody can see? I, well, I no, say, like, no, no, it was only secret from your husband. Oh, oh okay, okay. Because <laughs> you said he asked too many questions sometimes. That's right. And I don't like to have him ask questions before we get the answers right. so it can be on the video. All right, so this is diatonaceous earth. DE by, by definition. It's what's in your swimming pool filters. Mm -hmm. and it's the same thing we use for maple syrup. And this diatinaceous earth will stay in these compartments. These, these heavier, the wider compartments are hollow. And so oh. this goes and uh, does, oops, let me. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, didn't want to interrupt right. the counting. Yeah. <laughs> I know how that is when you're making cakes and everything else. So, Okay, now by you putting this in, okay, what exactly we, does this accomplish? This filters the syrup. It cleans it all up. As soon as I get it mixed up well, we will run it into the... See, basically we're using this as a vehicle to get the diatonaceous earth into the evaporator. I okay. mean into the filter press. And it'll fill these these chambers and if I counted right it'll just about fill them okay, okay that's mixed up pretty well so we just circulate it first Now about a gallon, a gallon and a half of the syrup is going to stay right in the press with, with the diatonaceous earth. And in a minute you'll see. So we're taking it out of here, yep. putting it through the tube, going through the filter, and then coming back in. Right, yeah. Okay. Just, and that's, that's, that's just to fill the, to fill the uh, filter press. And here it comes. See, that'll, yeah. that'll start to clear up in just a minute. As soon as it gets enough, enough uh, diatomaceous earth in the press. Already start to see a change in it. Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, see how it's yep. coming, coming golden now. Yep. That's just about ready to. Okay, so now 
we will shut the pump off and we will move this right into our can our canner and we will just we will pump the sap or the syrup right into the canner and now when that's done what does the canner do I have to reheat it it's, it's the, the temperature's down now to well we had 170 I yep. believe so now it'll cool it off more going through here it'll drop it down about 150 I've got a heater under there I have to bring it back up to 180 and then I can bottle it either in drums or or in uh, quart or gallon containers so that's the will, final process right that's there. it that's the final process yeah we do check the viscosity one more time when I get the canner full mm -hmm. or get to where I want a bottle and that'll be then we'll bottle and that'll okay now what would be like the shelf life now we, we've gone through all this and you have it and it's all set and you have it in the well, bottles or in the drums the they, they tell you the shelf life is a year but I've had it six years old and had perfect never last that long in our house but that's why I was <laughs> that's why I was curious what the shelf life is supposed to be well you know if you if you happen to get that quart in the cellar, it'll be good for a couple of years. Well, between the finished pancakes, which is a recipe we ended up getting at the Big E, oh, yeah. so your regular pancakes, your French toast, well, that, the uh, grits and everything else like that, and oatmeal, you know, I mean, that, it goes fast. That, uh, that, that finished pancake recipe is one we use for the bed and breakfast all the time. Oh, I love that one. Yeah. yeah. You know Probably what I also week. did with that? I put some apples in it with a little bit of cinnamon oh, yeah, on top yeah. of it. It makes it real nice. Yeah, yeah. Real good. Yeah, okay. Now I'm going to move this over. See, when we're on this side of the evaporator, I can cheat. And once I have the viscosity right, I can pump directly over. I can't do that when I swap sides. I have to carry it, but I'm getting old, so I like this side. <laughs> I might add to the hose one of these days so I can reach over there, too. So that's for a few minutes. That'll be... Yeah, we'll run a few more batches in here, and then we can bottle it. Okay, we've run we've run the syrup through the through the filter press into the canner. We've heated the canner back up to 180 degrees, and now we're going to bottle syrup into pint, quarts, and half gallons. That seems to be the most popular sizes today. And as you can see, we don't have much on the shelf, so this is all manual. All by guess. This is medium syrup we're bottling today. We checked it, and in fact, I'll show you in a minute. Should have done that first, shouldn't I? Well, That's we okay. did. I'm enjoying the aroma. All right. We took a sample, and we put it into uh, into our grading kit. And uh, all we did, we today's sample. This is, this is the syrup that we're bottling today, and we put it in our, in our kit, we put it up to the sun, and we check the color to make sure this is light, this is medium, this is dark, and we want it to be about equal to this one, which it is today. It's not dark enough to be dark syrup, so it's definitely medium. It's, it's too, too dark to be light. So we're going to bottle medium. Later this afternoon, we'll be bottling light syrup because what we're bottling right now is sat in the evaporator for two days from the night before last and I'm sure the next batch will be lighter and why is that because it's fresher it hasn't had the bacteria chance for the bacteria to work on it actually I don't mind making medium that is the most marketable syrup most people prefer medium however I do need to have 15 or 20 gallons of light syrup for my candy. I make a lot of candy for farmers markets in the summer. Yeah, that's always a popular item I see with uh, actually adults as well as the children. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, they always say it's for the kids, but we know better. That's right. I do a farmers market down in Worcester. And all the nurses and doctors come running out to get their candy fix every Tuesday. <clears throat> And they aren't saving it for the kids at all. Natural energy <laughs> they need. That's right. They'll pick them up in the afternoon. Okay, I'm going to cap these before we go any further. We like to get them capped right away. 
is actually they vacuum, they, they seal themselves as they cool by vacuum. And we also lay them down so they'll seal better. Really? Yeah. And now why does that make them seal better laying down? Because it coats the inside of the cap with okay. the syrup. And just as a extra, I can make sure if there's a leaker. Now you get a shot in here. Huh? Yeah, with the nice embers there and stuff. This is our supply, our wood supply for the year for the sugar house. Inside the, sh inside the shed here, there's probably 15, about 15 quart of wood, or there was when I started Monday. And then behind the sugar house is another four or five cord, which will definitely see me through this winter. Usually what's inside the shed will take me, usually that 15 cord will do it. But as you can see, of course, we have next year's wood also, because it w we burned some hardwood, some pine. It takes the hardwood two years to cure. Right. Uh, I buy most of this, what you see here, I bought tree links, had it delivered, I bucket up myself, and then I have a splitter that goes on my new tractor, and uh, I split the wood and put it in these racks so that I don't have to handle it again until it goes into the evaporator. We move it back and forth with the forklift on the tractor. A lot of the wood is given to us, uh, the pine, the pine is usually given to me, the, like I say, the hardwood I buy, buy the cord delivered to try to keep the cost as low as we can. Mm -hmm. uh, it does. It uh, it does cost me three dollars a gallon yeah, say, yeah. in in wood to make a gallon of syrup, which uh, probably the cheapest fuel you can use. Besides all the manual labor that goes into it. Well, just, but I don't have anything better to do all summer and fall, you know. So <laughs> you're right, have right. to have to keep it trim and slim, you know. <laughs> well, it's been working for you, so evidently yep. it's really good here. And, and then. The, your property, how many acres of land do you have here? Actually, we only have 2.4 acres here. Okay. We have virtually no trees. I have one maple tree down the driveway. So I rent all my trees from, from neighbors and people all around Granby. Uh, so needless as you saw this morning, I have those collection points I go to where there's actually 18 of them all together. So if you're looking for a site, what do you look for in a site? I look for a group of trees large enough to make it worth my while. And now I'm getting fussy. I want them where I don't have to take the lines down every mm -hmm. year. Yep. I do have to take some yard lines down, but uh, mostly I look at where I can leave the lines up. Where I, I like to have 30, 40, 50 taps at a, in, a, in, a, in an area. Mm -hmm. uh, I love to have a sugar bush with seven or 800 taps, but uh, that's just not, a, not possible right here. In this immediate area, there aren't that kind of maple trees. But if somebody was interested and they had such a, uh, a setup right there, they could get in contact with you, you take oh, a look and see oh, what could oh, be yeah. done. Oh, yes, yeah. Yeah, I, I have people call me every year uh, offering me trees. And I go and check. Well, uh, that one setup we did this morning, yep. you know, is a good example. That I just set that up this year. Uh, I'd been in that woods a couple of years ago and the stuff, well, it wasn't quite big enough. This year, it's fine. It was, it was good size. It's grown enough. It's amazing how fast these maples will grow. Uh, once they get to be about 30 years old, they really blossom out and start to grow fast. And uh, I have some trees that, you know, the end tree on these lateral lines, yep. I actually circle the tree with tubing. And that's how we hold the tubing up. Well, I've, this year I had to extend four or five of those because they were too tight for the trees. So I had to add, had to add more line. We do have a potential problem with maple syrup. Uh, Japanese beetles, which have been introduced, probably everyone's heard about them in Worcester, where they have literally taken down at least 20,000 trees to date and are going to take down more. Uh, Japanese beetles bore into the top of the maple trees, then they bore straight through the tree and they kill it in the heart of the tree. It does take, it takes several years, quite a few years, probably eight or ten years to kill a tree but when they do, there's nothing you can do about it. Uh, they are trying inoculating trees uh, in a perimeter around it. Uh, so far, it's worked. Uh, they they haven't ex they haven't had to expand the zone this year. Uh, they did up until this year. So hopefully, the uh, I can't remember the name of the chemical they use, but uh, uh, it seems to be working. Seems to be helping. 
Uh, of course, Massachusetts Maple Producers Association has a problem with its chemical because, of course, the chemical is put into the tree and it's going to stay in the tree. We did get the Department of Agriculture to agree to put, to put metal tags on any tree that they treated with this culprit. And that tag will stay on the tree until they come up with research to tell us that it's okay after a certain length of time to use the, to use the sap. And of course these are mostly, yard, mostly yards up, you know, Boylston and north, north part of Worcester. Mm -hmm. Hopefully uh, they've contained it. And hopefully this uh, uh, chemical will eventually dissipate so that the trees will be okay. But until, until they do some research to find out, that we're going we're gonna to hold fast to making sure they tag them. The last thing we want is something like that in pure maple syrup. Now we're filling half gallons. Thanks, but they take a little bit longer. This is beautiful with the medium oh, syrup. Yeah. Perfect. Beautiful amber yep. color. Yep, perfect color. Actually, I could use this for candy. It would still come out pretty good. They can still candy. see the heat there and stuff, and yet, in, you know, into the containers where it's... Oh, yeah, well, it's, it's, a, it's about 180 degrees. I like, to, I like to bottle between 170 and 185. If you go hotter, you have to get crystals in the bottom. Mm -hmm. uh, and, of course, if you, if you go too cold, then it'll spoil. So while you're doing all this, Mona, your wife, she's working on the bed and breakfast. That's exactly right. Yep. So it keeps the both of you busy at all times. Yep. Maybe afterwards we could take a, a, a little gander into the bed and breakfast just to see what it was like? Oh yeah, sure. Mona would love that. Okay. Yep. Maple syrup is not, in, not inexpensive. It's worth every nickel you pay for it, but uh, uh, it is an expensive product and deserves to be treated that way. And we can see, and it, we can see the reason why though with all the work that goes involved in on it. Yep. It's really a bargain when you look at the hours that are spent in producing we, this. We, we don't think about that. <laughs> we just do it. <laughs> yeah. Well, we're, we're, yeah. we're thankful for people such as yourself and, being well, able to produce it so that the other people can enjoy it. Well, it's been a lot of fun doing this. I'm, I'm awful glad you came out and it was great. Uh, <laughs> okay, and right. thank you for all your time. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, now that we have left Ed at the Sugar House, I wanted to come up and get a sneak peek at the bed and breakfast that uh, Mona has in, in here. And so if you will follow me, we'll go and get a, a, a brief little tour on that. Mona? Hi. 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 I'm Susan Grimaldi. Hi. How Hi. Are you? Good, good. We were visiting with Ed with yeah. doing the sugar shack and stuff, and he said that you would be glad to just give me a brief little uh, sure. tour of your bed and breakfast. Sure. Come on in. Okay. Thank you. Hey, Mona, I was asking Ed, I said, okay, you're spending all this time at the sugar house and, and you're putting all the wood in, you're stoking it, getting everything all ready for the maple syrup. You were so kind to bring down some sandwiches oh, and some no coffee problem. and things like that. So I said to Ed, I said, well, gee, I says, if you're spending all this time, you know, doing for the maple syrup, what does Mona get to do? And he said, why don't you ask Mona? So Mona, I'm asking you, what do you get to do all this time when Ed's down there working on the maple syrup for everybody. I get to cook for Ed. <laughs> <laughs> so when Ed's down there, um, you know, many times he's, there's been times when he's been there at midnight. So when there's a big, uh, you know, a lot of uh, sap to cook, he just stays out there until it's, it's done. And uh, so I make sure he's fed. <laughs> and, uh, you know, in on the other side of it, I have a bed and breakfast here. It's called Parker's Bed and Breakfast. Mm -hmm. And um, I run my bed and breakfast, and Ed makes a very mean bed. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good so right So he's there. helpful to me, too. So we help each other out. A good teamwork. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Would you mind just giving us like a little overview no, of your bed and breakfast? No, not at all. Uh, the room that you're looking at now is our great room. It's our home. Mm -hmm. um, it's a, this is a three-bedroom house, and we have, we're on the side of a hill here um, by the mountains. And um, we have a, a one-bedroom apartment in the lower level, 
And uh, when it's not rented out, which it is right now, I've rented it for the winter, um, I rent it, I use it for the bed and breakfast. And so uh, I can sleep four adults down there. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a, a Danish uh, a couch that's very comfortable in the living room and they, and anyone could come and cook if they made the arrangement to do that. But uh, So that's very comfortable down there. And then we have, on this end of the house, we have two, be uh, two bedrooms with a shared bath. And uh, so we feed uh, everyone out here in this dining room. Our great room has turned into our office. Mm -hmm. When Ed retired from a building, uh, we made uh, one of the bedrooms into a, a, one of the office into the bedroom. So his office came out down here. So we have our living room, our office, our kitchen, and our dining room all in one room. And it's been very comfortable. And Ed was talking about an old clock. And yes, he said that it was up here in the bed and breakfast. Yes, it's right, it's right here uh, at the end of the kitchen area. Okay, now this clock you were saying this was, you think that this was probably built by somebody in Ed's family? Yes, probably. It could have been his great grandfather. I'm not sure about that, but um, it has a wonderful story to it. Um, the, uh, the clock, uh, I don't know if you've heard of the grandfather's clock song. My, no. my grandfather's clock was too tall for the shelf, so it stood 90 years on the floor. And um, it goes on that it, eventually the old man died and this clock stopped never to go again when the old man died. And so uh, a wonderful story that came up out of that was that um, Ed's great aunt married uh, the composer Henry Clay Work. And he is the one that wrote the song about the grandfather clock. And so because they did actually live in that house in Greenwich, well, one of the lost towns in Quabbin Reservoir, um, they feel that this is the clock that the song was written for. And interestingly enough, there was um, a clock, grandfather's clock in England, and um, that family claimed that th they have the clock the song was written for. But the Parker family feels that they have the best story and all this documentation of um, him having lived there. Uh, so we think that this is the clock. And this is the first bedroom there you were showing me. And um, if you could just kind of you know point it all out there. It looks like it was uh, decorated by an interior decorator. Did you have uh, somebody come in to do this for you? No, I do all my own decorating. Whoa! Uh, it's, uh, uh, and I, just, I have always loved decorating. And I used to have a shop over in, in South Hadley at the Village Commons. And, and um, that's when people said to me, uh, would you come and bring your curtains to my store? And, and that's when I should have said, okay. <laughs> but anyway, um, we've, it was fun doing this. And this room here was Ed's office before he retired. And um, he was a builder, and so the office was in here. And um, so when we decided to uh, pump up our bed and breakfast and our sugar house business mm -hmm. uh, during retirement, um, this room became, um, much to Ed's dismay, a, uh, another bedroom for the B&B. &B. And we had these, these were, um, these beds right here were um, beds that my sister and I used as bunk beds at one time. So that was a couple years ago. <laughs> <laughs> so we decided because of the room was uh, comfortably large, we were able to get another bed in. So um, with the five college area, which we really do a lot of business with, um, uh, for graduations and all the kinds of things that happen uh, with uh, people coming uh, from California or wherever to uh, see their kids. Um, this is great. Uh, a couple could bring in their daughter in to look at Mount Holyoke College and they could all stay in the same room. It gets the price down a little bit for them mm -hmm. and makes the whole thing um, less expensive. So, and it's so nice uh, and homey too. Yeah, we tried to, you know, um, that was a, an old piece that came out of Ed's um, mother's family home in Plimpton, Mass. And so, um, you know, we cleaned it all up and uh, it's, it's made sort of a fun focal point in this room. And uh, um, yeah, this has been a great room. And I, I was a little concerned about not having the big queen size bed in, but this has been used a lot.
We call this the brass bedroom. The other ones are the three bedroom. <laughs> and so uh, this one um, is a, a few old antiques that we've picked up along the way. Um, this is a queen size bed in here. And uh, obviously this gets asked for a lot. Uh, a couple comes in, they like this. Um, if you're lucky and no one's in the other room, this one does have a, uh, a door that leads directly into the bath. So uh, someone every once in a while comes and finds to their much, much to their surprise and happiness that they have a private bath. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise it's a shared bath and it works out very well. Yeah. Yeah, it's very, very pretty, very spacious, and very uh, open, which is yes, what I yeah. really like about it. Yeah, uh, you know, and I and I think people enjoy the old things in here, and uh, so it's a comfortable little room, and uh, we enjoy having everybody that comes. Uh, we have found in our, we started doing it after I closed my business in uh, 1999, and by the next spring, we were doing it on the farm. So we've been in business for a number of years now, and uh, we have found that uh, there are very dedicated b and beers, and there's not a bad one in the bunch. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sure once they find out about this little treasure, you know, situated in Granby and having a, a side uh, trip there to the Sugar Shack, uh, you know, I'm sure that they'll really be uh, very pleasantly surprised yeah. and I, enjoy yeah, their stay here. They, they really do. And, you know, uh, of course, I have to feature uh, Ed's Maple Syrup in my breakfast so that happens a lot and um, it, it, we have it's it's a lot of fun and uh, it's very enjoyable to work with people that come in okay Mona well thank you for taking the time uh, to show us uh, your bed and breakfast there and do you have anything you'd like to say to our uh, viewing audience well I'd like to tell everyone that we really enjoy what we do here very much uh, we would love to have you come and uh, surprisingly enough, a lot of local people send their um, company. A lot of people don't have the room for their company. And so the company come and stay here with us. We give them breakfast and then off they go to spend the day with you and come back and sleep with us. So it, it all works out. Um, uh, we love what we're doing and we try to make you as happy as possible. Okay, thank you, Mona. Yeah, thank you very much.